this uh, virus is something that is, of course, worldwide. It's not specific to the Jewish people. But unfortunately, I do understand that, that in the United States and in England and in France, speaking to people there, it, at least at the, the beginning um, of this epidemic and pandemic, has affected um, the Jewish community in a, in a greater measure than others even. Um, so it is, I feel appropriate on Tisha B'Av, and especially if in any way this could help anybody, um, to speak to two doctors, um, to Dr. Zelenko, to Dr. Bartlett, um, who are on with us, and to hear what they say about, of course, there's been tremendous controversy about uh, their, the medications that they speak about, and we'd like to hear their points of view um, on, on these issues and on this uh, medication, and is it something that even here in Australia, where uh, is it something that we can uh, participate in and take ourselves? I don't believe it's uh, easily uh, something that we can get at the moment. I think they have uh, stopped selling it, or at least the directly chlor chloroquine is not easily, um, not easy to purchase. But we do want to hear your opinions and uh, practical opinions at such. And, um, and you obviously have two different uh, perspectives and ways, and we'd like to hear that. Um, and we are particularly grateful to Dr. Zelenko because of his um, fact that he went through a tremendously difficult operation. Um, when we first requested a few weeks ago from Dr. Zelenko if he would do this talk to, for us tonight, um, he said he would really like to, but he doesn't know if he'll be able to. And we were only able to confirm it early this morning um, here in Australia time. And uh, only then were we able to let people know. And of course we have uh, over um, with, the, with Facebook and, and the Zoom, um, well over 150 devices and um, many of them with more than one people. So we have a few, on, a few hundred people and um, we have my whole community here or those who are here from, from our community watching as well. So there are hundreds of people interested in hearing um, from you. And uh, we really are grateful because we know it's not an easy time for you, Rabbi, uh, Dr. Zelenko, to be able to come on and, and address us. I'd also like to um, mention that uh, Dr. Bartlett is actually uh, going to be seeing, um, he told me today, oh, hi, he's going to, uh, it has an event with the President of the United States, uh, I understand today, and therefore initially wasn't sure he could make it on this early, um, but we thank you for being here with us as well. So I'd like to first begin with uh, Dr. Dr. Zelenko, if you could uh, address us first. One second, we can't hear you. I need to, we need to be unmuted. Oops. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. Thank you so much for having me and uh, to all your audience. It's a privilege to be able to share ideas with, with you that may save life. <clears throat> I mean, my voice is a little uh, weaker than usual because uh, I just came home from the hospital yesterday. Uh, I had open heart surgery to remove uh, a tumor from, from my heart. And I was on the respirator for a few days and it affected my voice. But um, I feel this is important enough that um, I, that I should uh, make the effort to, to share these ideas. Um, COVID-19 at this point should not kill anyone. And, and no one, most people should not be getting into the hospital. And the reason why is because we have information now, published information, well, uh, enough experience, available data for anyone who is honest and anyone who's intellectually inquisitive that they could find uh, and the following. And I'll just speak about my data because that's what I published that if, um, we'll call it the Zelenko protocol uh, for, e for the ease of uh, conversation, but I'll describe to you in a minute 
what it is. If the Zelenko protocol is followed, what I saw was an 84% reduction in the need for hospitalization in high risk patients and a survival, a death rate of 0.7% in high risk patients. Not overall patients, overall patients, that's actually uh, the death rate is less, but in high risk patients where you would expect to see a 10% death rate, I was seeing a 0.7% death rate. That, that, that's needs, that needs to be understood because the implications here are, are global because the treatment that I'm advocating is uh, available in pill form. It's uh, affordable, which is not a small thing if it, because we, this is a global problem and we need to be able to scale treatments globally that anyone and everyone who needs it could get access to it. Um, it's easy to make and it's incredibly safe. Now, let me describe the Zelenko protocol. It's not, let, and it's not the medications. Let's not go to the medications first. Let's go to the more important parts. It's called the risk stratification. You have to identify the patients that are high risk to have complications from COVID-19. And it's not too hard. Just go to the ICU or go to the hospital and see which patients are dying. And you'll see it's people over the age of 60 or people under the age of 60 with uh, other serious medical problems. The young and the healthy, as a general rule, do not die from this disease. And in reality, COVID-19 is safer for children than the influenza virus. The influenza virus kills more children every year than COVID does. So this is a, the properties of this virus are designed to attack the vulnerable of our population, the weakest of our population, the frail, the nursing home, residents, the people with, with cancer, people with blood pressure, heart disease. And, and for some reason, it's dose related. So, which means doctors, first responders, nurses, people that get high levels of viral load exposure are also vulnerable. In other words, it seems that the amount of virus that you're exposed to also makes a, a significant impact on the severity of the disease. So what I've just done for you is I mapped out uh, a rather narrow portion of the population that is vulnerable to COVID and that we need to deploy our resources in that population to prevent them from developing the complications that we know they will develop. And we're talking about a 10% death rate in that subset of patients. You know, in nursing homes, at least in New York, there was a 50% death rate. Think about that. Okay, so that's the first part of the Zelenko protocol. Basically, cherry pick the patients in danger. Very simple, anyone could do it, but that needs to be done. Number two, it's called common sense. You have to treat this infection like we treat every other infection in medicine or like we do everything else in life. For example, if you have a fire, you call the fire department and you expect them to come right away to put out your kitchen fire. You don't wait for the whole house to burn down before you call them. Or if someone has cancer, we don't say to them, we have to wait until you have stage four metastatic disease before we will treat you. 
or when someone has an infected toe, we don't say you have to become septic and have dead before we're going to treat you. We're going to intervene right away. If you look at the CDC, they recommend starting treatment for influenza virus within the first 48 hours of symptoms with uh, antiviral drugs like Tamiflu. Why? Because that's when it works. Okay. Why is it, and this is a question, I mean, I know the answer, but I'll just pose it out there to, to people. Why is it that when it comes to COVID-19, all common sense has left the planet? Why is it that when it comes to COVID-19, we do not treat the symptoms of the infection early until the patient is in the hospital on a respirator, let's say. If you look at all the studies, which in my opinion were designed to fail, all the studies were done, let, let's go each one by one. The, the study in the VA system in uh, Virginia was done on patients who were on the respirator at least 17 days in the hospital <clears throat> on average. And they were critically ill and they had a death rate over there of 90%. And they found that if you use hydroxychloroquine there, it didn't work. Fascinating. Uh, and then the nefarious part was that they then extrapolated the conclusions of that study to the outpatient say, setting, saying, well, if it didn't work for the uh, uh, almost dead ICU patient, then it, it won't work in um, the outpatient setting. Completely logic. Uh, a logical fallacy, completely dishonest, and 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 just just evil. I would say. I'll give you many other examples. The the studies in Oxford, yeah, they found that hydroxychloroquine kills people. It's true. But the only problem in that study, they were using 2,400 milligrams of hydroxychloroquine a day. Just to give you a sense of scale, I, I used 400. So they were using six times the recommended dose of hydroxychloroquine. That was enough to kill a fat elephant. So yeah, people would die. Well, people would die from uh, Tylenol if you gave them a whole bottle also. Yeah, you know, so you have to ask yourself, why were people being euthanized? Literally murdered in a study to come out with a certain uh, expected outcome that hydroxychloroquine is dangerous and, and doesn't work. Another study, the one that was the most evil of all was the Lancet study. Also part of, part of it was printed in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, that was retracted for fraud Meaning <laughs> everyone touted the study as, uh, you know, the end all study that conclusively, this uh, conclusively proved that it does, hydroxychloroquine doesn't work. The WHO, the World Homicide Organ Organization wanted to uh, uh, right away use that study as a basis to withdraw its recommendations and the use of uh, hydroxychloroquine. So then it found it was found out that all the data used in that study, which the peer review process, quote unquote, was supposed to validate and make sure that truth is being presented to the world, was uh, wrong or was paid off or whatever it was, but it failed. And the end result was um, millions of people were not getting access to medications because of the WHO. And I know this because I've been consulting seven governments um, that have reached out to me since March. And a few of them are from Central America. And one of them, uh, it's Chile. 
and I was dealing with Chile and Chile is very um, adherent to the WHO recommendations. And when I was dealing with them, trying to prove my, you know, my way and trying to convince them to try it. Um, and they didn't even want to talk to me anymore <laughs> after the WHO uh, retract, uh, retracted its recommendations. I'm going to tell you even the most nastiest thing. The FDA of the United States re removed its emergency use authorization for the use of hydroxychloroquine. They said it didn't work. It wasn't helpful. Um, but if you look into the details of their recommendation, they quote the fraudulent retracted study after it was retracted as the basis, at least part of the basis for the removal of their emergency use authorization. You can lose your mind to, to, to the duplicity and outright crimes against humanity genocide, mass murder that we're witnessing, living through. Okay, so that's the second uh, part of the Zelenka protocol. Common sense, treat the problem early. Choose the right patients that are high risk, treat the problem early. Early, as soon as possible. Preferably within the first five days of the onset of symptoms. I'll tell you why. The, if you look at the viral dynamics of COVID, the first five days, it's essentially flat. The amount of virus doesn't really increase too much and the symptoms stay relatively stable. Around day six, it, it flares like a what? <clears throat> I don't wanna use the word wildfire in Australia, but it's, it flares like a wildfire in Australia. And what happens is most patients come to the doctor and they don't come the first two days because they think it's a cold, it's gonna get better. By day two, they say it's not getting better. They, they call the doctor, say day three, they get an appointment day four or five. So when, when the doctor sees the patient, they're seeing them between day four and five. Now, if you would do the test now, at least in America, uh, in most places, it takes three days to get the results right now. Uh, some people can get the same day, but I, that's very rare. In most cases, it's, it's uh, three days. So someone comes to my office day five, they're still not that sick. If I wait for the results of their tests, that brings me into day eight and I did not treat them, now they're sick. So what I do is I do not wait for the results of testing. If I clinically suspect that the patient has the virus and it's pretty easy to diagnose, any seasoned clinician could master the diagnosis of COVID relatively easy, then you must initiate treatment. And here's the treatment. And now I'm gonna talk about the drugs, but the reason why I left off the drugs for last is because the other principles are much more important um, because there are several drug approaches that we may have that may be effective. I'm familiar and more experienced with one that, the other doctor may be familiar with others, but the point is, is you have to pick out the right patients and treat them early. Now, I use zinc, and I'm gonna say why I mentioned zinc first, because zinc is the virus killer. It's well known that zinc inhibits viral replication. Zinc inhibits the virus from, from making copies of itself. It does that by interfering in the function of an important enzyme called RNA-dependent RNA uh, polymerase or replicase. That enzyme is actually pretty important in several viral uh, RNA viral processes. And it's found inside the cell uh, of the person. And that's where the virus is. See, viruses can't grow on their own. They need to hijack the machinery of the cell and then use the resources of the cell to replicate. So that's how viruses work. They need to get into the cell. And in this particular case, the virus starts out here in the sinuses and in the nose. And by the way, when it's here, it's very easy to cure. 
it's when it goes down here when all the terrible complications happen. So you have five days, essentially, to get rid of the virus when it's here, before it goes here. Because when it goes here, it becomes a different disease. And so I use zinc, but to get zinc into the cell, you need hydroxychloroquine. And, that, and hydroxychloroquine has several mechanisms of action, but the most important one in this context is this zinc ionophore properties. In other words, it's a, it opens a zinc transport mechanism that allows for zinc to go from outside the cell to inside the cell. And that is important because that's where the virus is and that's where the enzyme called replicase is. And it begins to inhibit that enzyme. And by doing so, the viral load goes down because the body's immune system is actively fighting this infection. And we are weakening the enemy, helping the immune system to naturally clear this virus like it does in most other viral infections. So, and then I use azithromycin, but that's not a must. We can also use uh, doxycycline. And the, re the, re the rationale behind using an antibiotic is the main complication of COVID-19 is um, secondary bacterial pneumonias or opportunistic infections that overwhelm the lungs and lead to lung damage, catastrophic lung damage. So uh, it's like a, a layer of protection um, so the person doesn't develop pneumonia. So again, you get the zinc into the cell to kill the virus and you protect the patient from developing complications by giving them an antibiotic. And that's a Zelenko protocol. It's extremely simple. It costs less than $20. And it literally, and it, it literally no, let's, I'm no longer, I'm past that point. When it's accepted globally, uh, history will be very, very clear who was on the right side of history, on the history of the humanity and the sanctity of life and who was not. Uh, I think I'll stop here. Thank you so much, Dr. Zelenko. Um, we'll have some more discussion about it soon. I I'd like to in, uh, introduce Dr. Bartlett for a moment. Um, just one question, Dr. Zelenko. Is, is there a preventative aspect to uh, these medications? In other words, if people do not have any, any uh, symptoms or any, any signs of the, of the disease or illness, is there any reason for people not to take or to take or how much to take of, of these medications? Yes, there is. Um, I wasn't focusing on the prevention because this was uh, a, a treatment talk, but there is prevention. I take it myself and every smart doctor I know is taking it and it's extremely safe and extremely effective. And I don't want to take up from Dr. Bartlett, but um, time, but if you want to return back to this uh, question, I, I, I have no problem doing so. Right. Well, thank you, Dr. Bartlett. I'm so grateful for you to, to come out and wake up so early um, there in Midland, Texas. Is that correct, the Midland? Yes, sir. Yes. Um, uh, I have a connection with Texas and the fact that my sister, and brother-in-law are the uh, head shluchim of the Rebbe to, of the Lubavitcher Rebbe to Texas. They live in Houston um, and they uh, have many uh, Chabad houses all over the great state of Texas. And uh, I know that you Texans are very proud. I know they've taken on that, that Texas pride. Um, and part of that uh, pride is the, I guess, the, uh, in the medicine here where you, uh, believe that you have another, um, um, should I say cure, or another method of uh, treating this uh, terrible disease. Um, so we thank you for coming on. If you can give us a little bit of a bio first to tell us uh, about your, your background and uh, tell us about what um, you're recommending and how, it's, how it differs from what Dr. Zelenko uh, has suggested. And maybe then we could have a, a conversation between the two of you. Well, first, I'm honored to be here. Thank you. Uh, I have tremendous respect for 
God's people. And uh, I was telling my wife last night, what a special opportunity to talk to the Einstein of our day, Dr. Zelenko. And I have tremendous respect for you, Dr. Zelenko. And we're pulling for you, sir. And know that our family loves you. Um, you're not alone. Thank you. Everything you said is absolutely correct. I agree 100%. Common sense, early treatment, uh, even the breakdown of the study. Uh, there's a ophthalmologist named Dr. Urso who has said that in that study, they proved that toxic doses of medicine are toxic. I love the common sense breakdown. And uh, so I'm a... I'm an MD in Texas. I went to Texas Tech in West Texas, where I live, and have practiced a family practice. I started my practice in a town that has one stoplight in the county. And so it's really frontier medicine, probably a lot like Australia in certain parts, where whatever comes into the emergency room, you got to take care of and you got to problem solve and uh, you know everyone, you know their family, and so you're trying to, uh, there's a lot riding on every decision. And, uh, and then I also work in the emergency room where again, someone comes in and they need you, they're looking to you for answers. Sometimes they need an immediate, uh, immediate solution. You have to think outside the box. And so, you know, uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob still answers prayer. And uh, he's all answers and all good things come from him. And so uh, he does pour out his rain on the just and the unjust, it's written. And I, uh, this came to me, this strategy came to me as a result of seeking him. And I'm doing, being quite frank, but uh, we know that um, this, is, this is a, and I, I guess you wanna know more about me. I, the governor of Texas asked me to be a part of a health disparities task force, uh, giving him advice on how to make sure all Texans have access to quality health care, that no one was left out. And so that was a new task force that he formed. And then he, it was a two year appointment and after two years, he asked me to join again for one more year. And that happened over and over for seven years, which seven is kind of significant, I think. But this disease is, a, is a, everything he has described, I, I understand about this virus, that it is a respiratory viral infection. The virus starts in the head and neck. And so there's some practical common sense things that have not been really broadcast to the people uh, that can make a difference. We're being told right now, late care only in the United States. The World Health Organization is repeating what communist China has said, which is being repeated again by the CDC, Dr. Zelenko. I think you're seeing that pattern, uh, that late care only. Don't give care until the house is two thirds burned down, then seek help. Um, don't, uh, if you have mild to moderate symptoms, stay home. Don't bother the doctor in the hospital. This is ridiculous. Early treatment, early detection and early treatment. Dr. Zelenko touched on a very important point. We call it uh, empiric care. When you, when you see the problem, uh, you treat it. You don't treat the test, you treat the patient. And if the patient has the sim symptomatology, they, they have the picture of the disease, then use common sense, use good judgment, and, and intervene. We do that with every other disease uh, that's life-threatening, and this is a threat. Putting it in perspective, we're told that half the people that catch this virus, that have this disease, don't even know they had it. They're asymptomatic. They're going to, uh, their, their immune system's going to kill this virus before they, uh, without any treatment, without a vaccine, uh, they're not going to need a vaccine because their immune system is going to do what they think a vaccine would do normally. It's going to uh, interact with the virus and then you'll have immunity. But uh, 
for the 20% or the 10% that are at risk of uh, this being a life-threatening condition, uh, it's better to treat it early. Um, I've seen uh, people turn around really quick. Uh, there's the, the treatment that I'm using is a corticosteroid. And this, uh, this is a respiratory viral infection. It's a breathing virus problem and a breathing treatment, a respiratory anti-inflammatory solution is effective against it. And I've had people who are fighting for their breath feel like they're drowning. And with the first treatment, they're telling me something that I've never heard with the medicine I'm using called budesonide. They say, I can, I can breathe. Uh, they feel the relief, this chest tightness, the shortness of breath literally goes away. Yes, sir. With the first dose, I was shocked when I received, I believe I received this from the giver of all good gifts. And I have used this medicine for over 20 years. But, but with this disease, this was the first time that I have ever heard a patient say they feel a difference while they're using it. Literally, it's like this medicine was made for this pandemic. And um, I, I have a, am of the same mindset because it's common sense and good judgment. And I'm on the front line in the emergency room or in a primary care setting where uh, you need to be proactive, you need to prevent, you need to treat early because if you treat a problem that's small, uh, it's much easier to have a good outcome instead of letting it progress. But uh, I have, I, unbeknownst to me, after I put my protocol on the internet and did my uh, a video that went viral, uh, of course, many of the viral, many of the videos got blocked by Facebook and Twitter and, and YouTube, and that's kind of a badge, badge of honor now. But uh, some, uh, a hospital south of San Antonio saw my video and they, they got their staff together and unanimously decided they would use this on their patients in the ICU. They didn't tell me that. In 48 hours, they emptied their ICU. Everybody went home. Uh, that's late disease. And it's because this virus binds to the ACE receptors in the lungs in the second stage of the infection. And when it's there, it triggers the release of inflammatory chemicals called cytokines and other inflammatory proteins. And people smarter than me did research and they found that those inflammatory chemicals are interleukin 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 11, 13, 15, SCF, GMCSF. It also releases cyto, uh, cyclooxygenase, which we use for, we use ibuprofen to block that. All, Aleve, all those things that we use for arthritis block cyclooxygenase. It releases, um, it releases uh, leukotrienes, which are inflammatory uh, chemicals that a medicine that's very cheap, singular or monoleucast blocks. But all of those, all those inflammatory chemicals that are released with this disease are blocked with corticosteroids. Now, the reason, I, the reason this is a strategy that is more brilliant than me, and I, I really didn't invent this medicine, I don't sell this medicine, and um, doctors uh, that are brilliant doctors are, are employing this as a tool. It's just one tool in the toolbox. Absolutely, hydroxychloroquine works. Dr. Zelenko, why would the United States give 2 million doses to Brazil during the pandemic if it didn't work uh, a month ago? I agree with everything you've said. You're a brilliant man. But uh, this is just another tool in the toolbox. And uh, I'm amazed that uh, more doctors aren't saying this is ridiculous. Why would anyone talk about Dr. Bartlett? Because this has been out here a long time. He didn't invent it. It's a, an effective tool. But uh, I think there's actually something uh, no, notorious going on, nefarious, uh, that uh, doesn't want an answer to this problem. But there is multiple answers, multiple tools in the toolbox uh, in our fight against COVID-19. And uh, hydroxychloroquine, tried and true. You know, after President Trump, our president, 
made that announcement that hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin work. Uh, it was three days later that another doctor, I think he's a doctor, I didn't check his credentials, but uh, he shot it down in three days. And, I, and so the whole world just dismissed it. But I got on the internet like anyone can, and in 30 minutes, I found 13 articles out of uh, uh, showing, uh, uh, it was 14 articles showing antiviral activity using azithromycin and hydroxychloroquine against, uh, it was against 13 different viruses. Uh, uh, there was, it was a long list of viruses, including SARS, um, and I, that was a while back, that was four months ago, so I don't remember it all, but it absolutely is well documented that hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin are antiviral, including two, um, SARS and SARS-2. So, uh, it's not a hidden secret for anyone that will, will dig and you don't even have to be a doctor to find this stuff. Uh, so, Dr. Zelenko, thank you for all your, your service to humanity, sir. Sure. But uh, this medicine is a very powerful tool. It's emptying the ICUs. What would happen if all the ICUs got emptied in 48 hours? But further, this medicine is being used by millions of Americans every day. Uh, I'm talking about budesonide, an inhaled steroid. It, it's used in a preventive way because asthma is an inflammatory disease in the lungs. COVID-19 is a super inflammatory disease in the lungs. And so for asthma, there are second graders that are able to give themselves breathing treatments with budesonide for five minutes at home while they're healthy to protect them from having an asthma attack. I, I mentioned to a doctor that's also a US congressman that I believe this is a hidden strategy for prevention. What if the high risk population you, does the same thing, uses an anti-inflammatory respiratory medication to block a respiratory inflammatory disease? In time, somebody's gonna act like they're a genius and they're gonna take credit for that. And I don't care who gets the credit, I just want people to live. Uh, but for now, uh, we have several tools that have been given to us. I am no longer afraid of COVID-19 and no one watching this needs to be afraid of COVID-19 either. We have answers. Dr. Zelenko, you were the front runner and I'm, I'm so honored to get to meet you, sir. But uh, we're having more and more answers to this problem. We are, we are not without help. We are not without hope. We, your people know of all people, we're with great hope and great help. And uh, that's where we look for our help and our answers. That's where our answers come from. We've been told, uh, wash your hands and you, you, you're experts at washing your hands and that's very important. But Dr. Zelenko, um, I saw an article uh, two or three months ago about mouthwash. And I, and I have found with patients when they have it, I'm telling them, get some mouthwash. This is a virus that doesn't stay only in the lungs. It's in the sinuses, the, na the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, and the throat. It's multiplying wherever it is. And so that's a simple strategy uh, as well. Another tool, very in inexpensive, as far as a preventive measure. Um, it, this, here's another thing, Dr. Zelenko, we're told to wear masks all the time. And so I, I'm, you can wear masks, you cannot wear masks. The, the college that I go to, our mascot is the masked rider. It's a gentleman that looks like Zorro riding on a horse or a woman riding on a horse across the football field. And so I'm used to masks. I'm not anti-mask, but if you, uh, if you, uh, if someone has the cold, we know that if someone sneezes on their hand, they have the cold, they touch a doorknob, uh, they, and someone else touches that doorknob, then uh, they could get sick. That's not a new idea. We, we would call an inanimate object a fomite. That's a fancy medical word for an inanimate object that could have an infectious agent on it. And so what a mask would be an inanimate object, right, Dr. Zelenko? And uh, your insight about the dosing 
uh, we call it an inoculation dose, an inoculation dose. If someone steps on a nail and there's one bacteria on it, that's the problem. If someone steps on a nail and there's 10,000 bacteria on it, that's a bigger problem. You're more likely to get an infection and, you're, and have your immune system overwhelmed. Well, there was study, a study came out a month ago saying that if you wear a mask, well, it, here's what it said. If you have SARS-2 and you're actively infectious, that you, the, the study said you can breathe out a thousand live viruses a minute. So in my little brain, uh, if you have a mask over your mouth and you're breathing a thousand viruses a minute onto it, and you're wearing that for 30 minutes, you're concentrating 30,000 viruses, live viruses on a mask right over your mouth and nose, and you're increasing your inoculation dose of a virus that they say can kill you. And um, uh, someone's gonna have to prove that is wrong to me before I'm excited about wearing a mask with this disease. It's a, it's a respiratory virus. It would be better to wear the mask over your knee or your elbow than right over where you're breathing it back in. But uh, so it makes me wonder about why they're saying that too, just to let you know that I have a concern about the inoculation dose uh, being concentrated. We know 50% of the population might catch SARS-2 and never know they had it. How many of those people are going to get a higher viral load a higher inoculation dose, and then they might actually tilt over to where they start having symptoms. What, what are your thoughts about that, Dr. Zelenko? Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, sir. we can hear you. So first of all, it's amazing how people from different parts of you know, the world come to the same conclusions. And I guess truth is truth. So you began to say that Everything comes from the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I, I believe that with every fiber of my being. And I also do not claim, take credit for any um, inventions or ideas. It's just uh, I couldn't sleep one night worrying about things. And I was treating a community of 35,000 people with nothing. <laughs> <coughs> And um, and I was looking uh, looking for an answer, and and an idea came to me. Like I I I guess all great ideas uh, have their source into the supernal wisdom, and um, I started trying it out uh, empirically, and that's what family doctors have uh, an advantage over the researchers that are in the laboratories is that we actually deal with human beings. We deal with human suffering. We see it before anyone else. So we have that empathy and that understanding to think outside the box to try to uh, find real time solutions for to relieve people's uh, pain, suffering, and then the risk of life. Uh, regarding the masks, I don't wear them. Um, even though I, when I see patients, and I'll tell you why. I take hydroxychloroquine and zinc every day. My um, experience with its prophylactic power is, is remarkable. I don't have enough experience to publish a paper, so it would be classified as anecdotal. But let me tell you one specific story that will bring the point out that I want to bring out. There's this one religious family in, in, that I take care of and they have uh, nine, nine people. The husband is uh, very, he's young, but he's very sick. He has heart disease and some other very serious condition. And, but the rest of his family are healthy, thank God. And so I decided to prophylax him with hydroxychloroquine and zinc, and, uh, but not anyone else in his family. A few weeks, a few weeks after that, um, they all got sick in his house. So, um, except him, he didn't get sick. Uh, so his wife, there's six children and one son-in-law. Got, uh, you know, they were pretty sick and they all got better. So then uh, a month after that, three weeks after that, I checked IgG titers 
to see if they had any immunity for COVID-19. And they all had extremely high levels of antibody, except him, he had zero. Now, it's, it's, it's a, we're gonna publish this as a case report and it de definitely focuses uh, a certain area of research that needs to be done on a certain aspect of this. But it, it's so remarkable that I haven't had any patient, and I, so who do I prophylax? I prophylax nursing home residents. I prophylax first responders of people getting a very high uh, viral load exposures, or I prophylax anyone. <clears throat> I prophylax anyone uh, who has serious medical problems because these are the people I do not want them to get the infection. But that that is a, on a case by case basis. Can make that recommendation yet uh, globally, but I could make the recommendation of uh, again the Zelenko protocol. But I would like to put a caveat. Uh, that I integrate Dr. Bartlett's uh, uh, methods, you see, <laughs> uh, and the reason why is there's three stages to this disease. The first stage is in the first five days. Patient's not that sick. You can still, in most cases, uh, get rid of the infection. If it goes past five, six days, now you're beginning to get into trouble. It's beginning to go here. And when I say trouble, it's two things. Blood clots. Unfortunately, we found that this virus causes strokes, cause, causes pulmonary infarcts. It, it, it causes a hypercoagulation where the blood just begins to clot, extremely deadly. And it causes uh, a release of the, the cytokine storm, which Dr. Bartlett mentioned in, in detail. And these are um, inflammatory markers that wreak havoc on the lungs. It's like pouring acid into the lungs. So that's a second disease. See, once the infection passes a certain threshold, and it's beginning to develop the secondary complications, that's when you're gonna start seeing people die. So for those patients, or it's an art, see, medicine is an art, or those patients that I just don't have a good feeling about, they just don't look good, whatever. I'll start hydroxychloroquine, zinc, azithromycin, budesamide, um, even ivermectin is another drug. I'll throw everything I have at the patient to keep them out of the hospital. I don't know if I answered your question, but that's uh, what I do. That's a brilliant answer. And one of the inflammatory chemicals that's released over the lungs, part of the cytokine storm, is called thromboxane. And thromboxanes are what trigger this uh, clotting throughout the body. So clots in the lungs, pulmonary emboli, clots in the coronary artery for a heart attack, clots in the cerebral arteries for a stroke. Uh, it can, so I put everyone that's an adult on, on a baby aspirin a day uh, as a prevention uh, to make it a little, so uh, you're ahead of the curve again, you're a leader in thought, Dr. Zelenko, uh, and uh, uh, I, uh, I, I uh, am following uh, a lot of the same logic there exactly. Uh, we, uh, but uh, thromboxanes are another one of the inflammatory chemicals. People smarter than me figured all this out. It's in the literature for the last 20 years um, about uh, the cytokine storm and the chemicals that are released. I just wanna say, I, I, forgot, I forgot to mention that I will use also uh, Eliquis or Zarelta um, for anticoagulation also. So sometimes I have people, you know, I know if they get into the hospital, they're not coming out. I have them on six, seven different drugs all at once with, I mean, I've only had two patients die out of 2,200. 
um, and I'm talking about sick patients. And the two patients that died, one had advanced CLL leukemia, and the other was in his late 70s, and you know, when he presented, he was very sick, and uh, just it was his time. But and I only had four patients on a ventilator, and they all got extubated. So I, I know this works, and we we can have our conspiracy theories why the truth is being suppressed. But I can tell you, it is obvious that Gilead Pharmaceuticals will make $3,200 a uh, course of remdesivir, which reduces hospitalizations from 15 days to 10 days at best. Um, um, and if my approach, if our approach is used, there's at least an 84% reduction in their market share. So we're looking potentially at a loss of a trillion dollars with a T. And I'm sure they're not happy about that. So I'm sure there are forces being motivated there to suppress the cheap medication so that people get sicker and need the more expensive medication. You wouldn't think that this would happen, but it's the modern day uh, gas chambers. I don't know how else to describe it. And, and that's number one. Number two, the president, and I'm, I'm gonna stay out of the politics myself because it's irrelevant in my politics, but political analysis is important. The president is running for re-election and he came out in support of this medication. He's on record on that. When this medication is proven to be a significant component of the solution, that's a tremendous political win for him right before a crucial election. So the enemies of, uh, of the president are willing to stop at nothing. Uh, financial, global financial ruin, uh, loss of a certain percentage of the population in order to regain power. And then, uh, and, and really there's an element of arrogance here where the, the Fauci types who believe that only they are uh, the owners of truth, that only truth could be generated through clinical trial data uh, and that real life world experience is irrelevant, which is I think a, an affront to all of human history. Because I have to tell you, if I'm in, drowning in an ocean and I see a piece of wood, driftwood, I don't need a clinical trial to tell me that it may save my life. I'm gonna hold on to it and see if it saves my life. I may get a splinter, but at least I won't drown. Okay, I don't need Dr. Fauci. I'd rather be uh, anecdotally alive and academically dead. Well said, sir. I might use that quote. I'm going to quote you. Well, thank you, our solutions. thank you so much. Can I ask you a few questions that have been put onto the chat that people are asking? Um, those issues that you brought up don't really apply, say, to something like Israel. Is Israel trying it? Is Israel work using it? Is it working there? Israel is, I, be, I was dealing with the Minister of Health of Israel, Mr. Litzman, for four weeks. And I was making uh, no progress, actually. And then he got COVID-19. And then all of a sudden, I was making a lot of progress because uh, yes. he saw the medication worked. And, and then there was some political upheaval, and he's no longer the Minister of Health. Wow. So I got the cell number for uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. A Edelstein, he's the new Minister of Health. Um, I've, I've harassed him maybe 10 times, but he hasn't returned my phone calls. I've sent him my, my studies, uh, ebook, explaining everything. Finally got through to a, a, a Dr. Kaufman, who is a, a deputy in the Ministry of Health. Um, he's actually a Lubavitcher and Maybe you can hit you and help me. And he said, well, in Israel, the bureaucracy, the um, protocols, the, it has to come within, from within. In other words, in Israel, it's death by arrogance. Pride does kill a lot of people in this disease. Listen, Israel, hmm? Israel, God forbid, but Israel's going to need another 20,000 corpses before they see 
they have to do something else. Heaven forbid. Um, I said that I said Pastor Sean before you, but okay. that's the point though. It need I think you need to raise some alarms there. Then the most stubborn country to deal with. Hmm. The other question that was asked is um, for first responders, what dose um, would you suggest as a prophylaxis? prophylaxis? So I use, um, I'll tell you what I recommend for others and I'll tell you what I do for myself. Two separate things. Um, hydroxychloroquine, uh, 200 milligrams, uh, once a day for five days. And after that, once a week. It's the, actually, that's the dosing for malaria prophylaxis. It has a very long half-life. And then I use the uh, zinc, 50 milligrams, elemental zinc, um, like zinc sulfate, 220 milligrams, once a day for five days, um, and then once a week as well. Um, and the reason why I do that is that it's a way to get a high loading dose of, um, of hydroxychloroquine into the patient, and then to maintain steady state, to maintain a good amount of concentration, weekly dosing seems to be appropriate. Uh, but of course, you need to take it with zinc. Remember, it's a bullet and it's, and a, it's a gun and a bullet analogy. Hydroxychloroquine is the gun, zinc is the bullet. You need synergy between the two in order to work. One without the other doesn't doesn't work. Now, um, I personally <laughs> take uh, zinc and hydroxychloroquine every day, and I have one lung. I've had recurrent sarcoma of the heart. I'm on chemo. I'm going to be on chemo, much more chemo now. I need radiation, so you know what that means for someone like me. All the high risk categories I fit into. So. Uh, I'm, I want to live. So I'm being hyper cautious, proactive as much as I can. And I, and I use bedesimide. That's a plug for you. <laughs> so, <clears throat> sorry. And, um, remarkable results. I, I really, I have so little fear of this virus. It, it's this, you see, I was learning in the, in one of our mystical teachings, in the Rizal in a time, it's a certain book written by Rabbi Isaac Luria, that there's something called uh, uh, Igulim or Maked the Ak. I'll explain to you, I, nev I never understood what that meant it, until now. And I, I, I think there's a certain element that is relevant to every single human being in the world, which is the, the, the need for peace of mind, Yish Yishibadaz. Certain a, a calmness in the head. People don't realize it, but when they do get it, they don't want to give it up. And our rabbis say, There's no joy like the resolution of doubts. The whole world right now has no joy. The whole world, every single human being, is living in a state of angst, a state of panic, a state of worry, artificially created by the way, to cause mass um, mass anxiety amongst the people so that they are easily manipulated. And what I've seen is, I'm, I'm a simple country hick doctor from upstate New York. I mean, how, how am I on a global stage advising seven countries? I'll tell you how. Is because I found something with, with Seattle Deshmai, with God's help, that gives a little bit of light of hope that there is a solution to this, that it's not the end of the world, that God gives the cure before the disease, and that we're there. And people are not dying from the infection, they're dying because of politics, because of money, because of arrogance, and because of fear. And that's, I think, a mock of the act. In other words, it's so relevant to every single human being, Jew, non-Jew, irrelevant, that the, the entire world is shaking. And this is an auspicious time. I think we can all agree that through 
love. You know, our temple was destroyed. You know, the destruction of the temple is literally like ripping the heart out of the people. And I'm a little sensitive to heart issues right now, I have to tell you. And it's, you want to have a healthy heart. You want to have something that is pulsating vitality th through all the veins of humanity and, and bringing God's light and blessing to everyone. And in many ways, COVID-19 is a natural outcome from the destruction of the temple. Because COVID-19 and the response of society to COVID-19 is uh, has been nothing more than evil. And evil has been given way too much room to, to have rain. Right now, we need to start pumping light and goodness, love, baseless love, unconditional love for all. And that, uh, a little light will push away a lot of darkness, we know. And I, I have zero fear. I understand the enemies that I chose up, that I started a fight with. The liberal left in America and the pharmaceutical industry. I very well know what they're capable of doing. But I'm all in. And, and what, what, that, what I'm trying to say is that th this is, there's no middle road right now. This is a fight for survival. This is, this is a world war of good versus evil. Going back to the most primordial, primordial forces of the serpent in the Garden of Eden. We're dealing with a manifestation of that. Now, there's nothing new under the sun. So this has been the recurrent theme throughout history. Every generation had their villains and had their uh, righteous people that uh, had the courage to stand up and say, listen, um, I'm going to give everything I can um, and more than I can for the cause of, of the sanctity of life to sanctify the name of God in the world and by doing so bring uh, about the re redemption of, of, of the world. So um, thank you so much. Um, just a, a couple of other questions that either of you could, could answer. Um, what, I mean, you can't access um, in Australia high, uh, hydroxychloroquine as far as I understand. Um, any suggestions? Dr. Bartley, you want to handle this or? Yeah, I, I guess they could say they're traveling to Africa. They need it for malaria. I guess they have to go to Africa. <laughs> I don't have an answer for that. I mean, the United States sent two million doses to Brazil. Uh, and that was a month ago because it worked. Uh, there's been lots of obstacles that are man-made. So I have an answer. I, I use... I like to have contingency plans. Um, I use a drug called quercetin. I'll spell it for you. Please write it down. It's important. Q-U-E-R-C-E-T-I-N. Again, Q-U-E-R-C-E-T-I-N. And this is a drug. Uh, visitor. This is a drug that does the same exact thing as hydroxychloroquine in the sense that it lets zinc into the cell. It's available over the counter without a prescription. I recommend 500 milligrams a day. If you're going to use it for prophylaxis, 500 milligrams a day with 25 milligrams a day of zinc, elemental zinc. Um, and it, it, for treatment, I would use quercetin, uh, double that. So I would double both. So quercetin, 500 twice a day, and uh, zinc, 50 milligrams. And I would use, use bidesmide also. And, um, and that's what I use for plan B with my patients that live in, uh, sorry to say, blue states where they don't, access to provide access to to medications 
Okay. Um, Dr. Bartlett, I had a question about the masks. You spoke about the masks, but aren't you, if you have the virus, aren't you safeguarding other people um, when you wear a mask? And you prevent it from spreading the virus? People want to wear masks, they can wear masks. I'm not anti-mask. I'm just saying that uh, a mask is an inanimate object that can be a fomite. And uh, it might contribute in time, science may prove that it's concentrating the viral load and uh, increasing the inoculation dose. But uh, we do have the laws of the land and at times that's forced upon us. Uh, so uh, I'm not, my message is about a solution to the problem. And my, my message is very focused that we have an answer to this problem. We have several answers, hydroxychloroquine and zinc, budesonide. Other doctors are using uh, steroid pack, medrol dose pack, and that's also effective. Uh, early treatment's the right answer. It's uh, so early treatment. And, and I have found uh, what's, what has been given to me is a respiratory anti-inflammatory solution for a respiratory inflammatory disease called COVID. And so my messaging is very focused. There's many things we can talk about that are true with this pandemic, uh, but uh, I'm not anti-mask. I don't want to get labeled that, uh, but I do have a scientific understanding of inoculation dose and fomites. And so I threw that out there. I threw that out there. And, uh, I do want to uh, ask one thing. I'm going to let the cat out of the bag uh, because I think I think it's important. I'm, I've been working with a group to develop nebulized hydroxychloroquine. Think about that. To be able like to deliver cat. hydroxychloroquine straight into the lungs getting immediate concentrations of, of drug. You don't have to wait a week. And, and for prophylaxis, it may have a major role. We're still working through the kinks. So uh, we're starting, uh, uh, I'm gonna start using it in the practice of medicine soon. So when I, when I can <laughs> practice medicine again, but um, just letting, letting you know that's coming. Wonderful. Again, forward, Again, forward thank, you. thank you so much. Now, um, is Dr. Bartlett, if you're your desonite, is that be used as a prophylaxis as well? Uh, so again, in the United States, we have 25 million Americans that have asthma. And the first line preventive measure that's recommended for people who have asthma to protect them from an asthma attack is daily use of an inhaled steroid. Inhaled because it doesn't have the effect total body of turning down your immune system, your ability to fight infection, of decreasing your ability to heal, of decreasing your muscle mass and your bone density, making people anxious, uh, causing insomnia, those are all effects of total body systemic steroids. The fancy word is systemic for total body doses of, of a medicine. And so you get the steroids either respiratory inhaled or it's targeted in the lungs. It is, using, it is being used by millions. This medicine, budesonide, is being used by millions of Americans every day prophylactically. And it's saving lives. Uh, so we have a disease that is parallel. It's a inflammatory respiratory infection, COVID-19 is. And if you use it, uh, I see great potential uh, for it to be used prophylactically to prevent uh, the disease. Everybody is, go you know, when they do testing in the United States, they're showing one in five people test positive. This disease is already widespread. If you think you can hide from it, that's a bad idea better just to take the uh, provision that we've been given from above and know that we that God, the, the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob doesn't want us to run away. We run to the fight. He, he gave the provision before we had the problem. I think you have lots of examples of that in history. Um, and so 
what Dr. Zelenko has stumbled on, what I've been given, both of us from the same source, is a provision, a solution to the problem. The problem has already been solved. We have the solution. This can be history in a day if, if, if government leaders would remove the obstacles that are truly man-made right now. This medicine that I'm using, budesonide, is already over the counter in a nose spray. Inhaled budesonide, it's a, stero it's a nose spray budesonide. It's just not over the counter in, in the form that you put in the nebulizer machine. A fancy word for the breathing machine that two second graders are giving themselves every day. It takes five minutes at home. And so we, if we had President Zelenko, uh, president of the world, we would have this over in a day. And so, Dr. Zelenko, you have my vote. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll mute yourself, Dr. Zelenko, you're muted. So you probably know, I've been re in contact with the highest levels of government. Um, and let's work together because, um, you know, I, I'm, I, I can barely walk. So I, I need some help. And I will, I, I will fight till then. I just, uh, I, I know the limitations of the body that I'm living in right now. And I have access to Senator Ron Johnson. He's a wonderful guy. And... Uh, Admiral Dr. Ronnie Jackson, who was just ran in Texas, I believe, for uh, Congress. Is that correct? And yes, sir. He's from my neighborhood. Uh, so I've, spoken, I've spoken to him. He's a big ally. He was the president's doctor. Um, I have access to Rudy Giuliani at will. Um, I have Mark Meadows' phone number, but he never calls me back. But And Stephen Hahn, I stopped calling so if we could work together, pool our resources. Together. We are together. God bless you. And today, uh, the president is coming with Ronnie Jackson to my town. And so if you have access to Dr. Jackson, let him know there's, there are solutions. You and I have the answer. So he, he knows. I, I sent him... He has all my, my data. He has my paper. I published a very rigorous ironclad paper. He has an ebook that I produced with Harvard and Yale MDs. And the data is there. It's just someone needs to open their eyes and see. Yes, sir. Well, you have my full support and commitment because we're both fighting against the virus. We're both against disease and death. And uh, you're a, a forerunner. And you have been ahead of the curve. And uh, I'm honored to know you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, Dr. Bartlett, Dr. Zelenko. Uh, we really appreciate it. And hopefully this, this uh, um, connection that we've made uh, will bear a lot of fruit um, for, mm -hmm. for the world, for America, for Australia, for Israel, um, and indeed for all humanity. Um, I'd like to, uh, um, first of all, once again, thank Dr. Bartlett and Dr. Zelenko. I'd like to wish Dr. Zelenko a refuah shlema. I'm sure everyone on this call um, at this Fabrengen, as we know what a Fabrengen could achieve, um, even the archangel Michal can't achieve. So Dr. Zelenko would like to wish you a refuah shlema, a complete and speedy recovery. Give us your Hebrew name, uh, unmute yourself first. It's a Z Zev Ben Leia. Zev Ben Leia should have a complete and speedy recovery, and you should continue your work to uh, literally save save millions of people, save humanity. Um, Hashem put you in this place, and uh, you've been uh, able to help so many people, and I should uh, give you the strength and the koyach and the good health to be able to continue to do so. And uh, very grateful that you were able to join us here. And for those who are asking, it will be on our Chabad of the North Facebook page. You'll be able to access the um, talk. Um, and I'd like to also thank Rabbi Ullman, both for his talk previously on Halacha, so for being, um, 
for being um, so um, for for uh, having uh, for speaking to Dr. Zelenko and for uh, um, connecting him and bringing him to the uh, to this uh, meeting and this talk tonight. Um, and I know Rabbi Zulman would like to um, say a few words um, on the halachic um, implications of the drugs that we we're talking about. I was in last four months approximately, I was asked by many uh, Jewish people from Australia and abroad, what is my opinion? Because the more controversy that Zelenko protocol um, has gained, the more questions came up. And the question is, what is that to do with halacha, with the Jewish law? We know that it's a medical question. But we know, as I mentioned before, Dr. Zelenka spoke, that there's an interesting paradox. On one hand, um, the Torah and Shulchan Aruch give so much respect to doctors. We know that in laws of Yom Kippur, we have to, we, there's a trust in, in the doctor's opinion as far as what is Cholish Yeshba Zakona, a sick person who's in danger or not in danger. And we see that Halacha trusts the doctors. At the same time, we see that many questions are given to Rabbonim to decide as for certain choices to make. As I mentioned before, the Lubavitcher himself, many times he would answer questions in medicine, Katsas Rav Moira Hiro, as advice, uh, to take advice from a rabbinic authority, halachic authority, uh, to answer a particular question. And I think the answer is in the words that Dr. Zlenka said, by the difference between just uh, talking about medical arguments and real life experience. Halacha actually ultimately accepts the idea of real life experience. And um, my first connection, I heard of Dr. Zelenko for many years, but um, I had to ask his advice a few months ago. And uh, I was connected by a mutual friend from a rabbi in Buffalo. He made a connection between us and I spoke to him a few times. And um, he was very, very convincing. You can tell that he really knew what he's talking about, but I had to make my own opinion because I heard so many other opinions also. So what I did was I've spoken to many communities and many people around the world, places like Toronto, Buffalo, Crown Heights, South America, and so on and so forth. And what I saw was that I haven't, every single person that I've spoken to uh, who has taken the drug, the, the protocol, I would say, the full protocol in the first days of um, symptoms, he was basically cured in, in, you know, almost immediately. And I can give many examples. In Toronto, there was a Hatzola member who was given it to dozens of people. And every single one he said was cured. I was looking for one person who would either suffer the effects of the medicine or wouldn't recover from it. I didn't find one. So if I saw so many people, I have people in my own family and my own relatives and friends who, who passed away from Corona, you know, some of them in a quite a young age, when they haven't taken this drug, uh, it wasn't available, it wasn't known to them, wasn't available to them, wasn't given to them. So the halachic position is very clear. If you have a deadly virus that causes havoc and death and destruction, and you have medical advice that you see a hundred cases or more, I'm only very limited, I'm not a doctor who treated uh, 2,000 people, but I've seen over a hundred cases of people that have taken it and were cured, the halachic position is very, very simple and very clear. And I certainly uh, shared the protocol and the letter which, was, which Dr. Zelenka sent to me um, uh, some time ago. I've shared it with many members of our community. And I told them to, there is a way, by the way, how, can, how you can get hydroxychloroquine. Uh, um, thank you very much. Uh, there, you have to sort of be a little bit out of the box, but there are ways it's difficult, but it's possible to get. Um, and it's good to keep it as a pass besaloi, either pro uh, for those who need it prophylactically and those who don't need it just to know that they have it in case. I just heard of Dr. Bartlett last week. My wife showed me, sent me that um, a clip. And to me, I hadn't have a chance yet to be able to really make my own studies. I did put this Lenka protocol, but to me, it sounded very convincing. I'm sure if there was one single case of uh, somebody dying from any of these drugs, we'd know about it. Uh, you know, with full force. There's no question about it. 
And the fact is nobody heard of anybody, anybody being damaged by those drugs, but you hear many, many cases of pe people being cured and lives being saved. So from my perspective, that's the position of not only medical position, but a position of halacha, which is the real life experience.